Okay. And also admit, admit, admit. Right. Can you see my screen is the question? Yes. And, you can hear me, and I'm not too quiet. Yeah. Oh, good. good. Awesome. Phew. Um, well, to kick us off, um, I will try and keep an eye on people uh, needing to be admitted, which is quite hard when you're sharing your screen. Uh, but anyway, welcome everybody. Really, really excited um, uh, to, uh, yeah, to be chatting with you all today. Um, and thank you for Lilau, John and Cicelyn, uh, who are my rock star Blue Carbon Partners in Crime in Madagascar. Uh, who are joining me today and we're really excited to give you an overview of BB's Blue Carbon work and answer all of your burning questions. Um, uh, it is an informal session, so, uh, so pretty relaxed, nothing too hectic. Um, the call is being recorded um, for those that couldn't attend um, and that still want to listen um, and also critically as a resource for new employees. Um, joining in the future to give them an overview of our um, blue carbon work. Uh, you should be able to see a broad overview. Um, I'm not going to read it all out because you can read it. Um, but yeah, the first few minutes, um, John, our blue carbon science manager in Madagascar, is going to tell you all about what blue carbon is. Um, and then I'm going to give you a Quick overview of how it aligns with our strategy. The second 30 minutes, um, led by Lilau um, and Cicelyn, um, really about you know, what have we done so far um, and what have we learned. Um, and then the final 30 minutes uh, are going to give you an overview of what the future look like, looks like for Blue Carbon. Um, just some quick ground rules, which I hope everyone's still being able to enter. Chat. Gee, just too many buttons. Um, a few ground rules being that um, there is no such thing as a stupid question. Um, so yeah, please feel free. We're trying to leave as much time as possible for questions and answers. Um, so feel free to ask any question you may like. Um, everyone has a voice. Um, so feel free to, to shout up. This is very much a safe space for all of the questions you ever wanted to ask about blue carbon. Um, with the questions, there's kind of two, um, uh, two two ways that you can, uh, you can ask. Um, pop them in the chat box um, and we'll go through them um, during the Q&A sessions or you can just raise your hand um, during the Q&A sessions. Um, yeah, there, I think there are going to be a fair few people in the line so it's, it's going to be a bit too much if everyone's kind of like jumping in so it is going to require a little bit of moderation. Um, and yeah, lastly, just the reiteration that this is, yeah, super informal. Um, feel free to jump in, jump out as your schedule allows. Uh, and yeah, enjoy. Um, at the end, um, Jenny is kindly, um, is kindly doing some, she's going to do a little uh, sense check um, about halfway through. Um, and also it's going to, we'll ask a question at the end just to kind of gauge your thoughts on the session, because this is kind of the first one that, that uh, the BB has run like this. Um, and also afterwards, we'll be reaching out for feedback if you have the time and energy to give said feedback. Um, uh, I think that is pretty much it. I'm going to stop sharing so I can get my uh, full controls back and check that I've let everybody in. Um, so uh we are recording i think i just want to check that yes recording um cool so without further ado um john uh, i will hand over to you so john's our um, blue carbon science manager in madagascar um and yeah we're going to talk you through um blue carbon what is it so John, feel free to share your screen and kick off whenever uh, you're ready. Thank you, Leah. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to talk today about uh, a little bit about blue carbon. Uh, okay. Just a minute. Okay, uh, what is uh, blue carbon? Uh, first of all, 
Glucagon is a term used to describe the organic carbon captured and stored by the oceans uh, and uh, coastal ecosystems. Then the most uh, carbon rich blue carbon ecosystems are mainly mangroves, seagrasses, and salt marshes. PV works in the tropics, so our focus is mangroves and seagrasses. Historically, we have been focused on mangroves because the science is more clear for mangroves, but uh, in the future, we hope to also focus on seagrass because uh, many of the LMMIs that we support include seagrasses. You can see the links for more information if you are interested. Uh, well, uh, blue carbon ecosystems are found in a small extent, but uh, appeared as the most threatened ecosystems on the earth. Let's take uh, mangroves as example. At uh, the current rates, we will lose half of mangroves uh, over the next 30 years at a global scale. Uh, moreover, on the on, uh, other hand, they are productive ecosystems and uh, they provide goods and uh, services such as food, protection uh, against storms and uh, wood materials to coastal communities whose life depends upon. And uh, the carbon stored in these ecosystems is just uh, one of these goods and services. Secondly, blue carbon ecosystems are recognized as either carbon sinks or carbon emission sources. Why? They are such uh, remarkable uh, ecosystems having specialized characteristics, such an uh, unique environment which can grow in saline tidal water, plus the carbon they store in the trees. The most important, the most important point to learn about uh, blue carbon ecosystems is that uh, they have great potential in sucking in and storing uh, CO2 or dioxide, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere due to the ability to trap particles by the root structures and uh, accumulate these particles as organic carbon into the soils. This means that uh, carbon is constantly being added to the mangrove mud because of the submergence, it's locked in and uh, kept there for a long time. Because of this uh, particularity, protecting them is really important for the fight against climate change. That's one thing. And uh, on the contrary, when these ecosystems are lost, a lot of this stored carbon can be released back to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide adding to climate change. What does it mean for us? It means that their conservation is doubly important. Now, we come to the point that uh, blue carbon ecosystems, due to their great potential in carbon sequestration and storage, can be a new source of financing which will sustainably support their conservation and restoration initiatives. Uh, this, this is uh, an approach to slow down climate change, like uh, the terrestrial forests the carbon that blue carbon ecosystems sequester and store can be sold through carbon financing mechanisms. Uh, one more thing, any initiative that conserves or restores mangroves or seagrasses can be called uh, a blue carbon project. 
to make this carbon selling happen. The project needs to demonstrate that uh, the activities the, they implement reduce carbon dioxide emissions and uh, sequester more carbon when compared to the baseline I meaning is of the project itself. Then the amount of carbon that we afford of conservation and uh, restoration made can be sold as carbon credits so that uh, individuals and uh, organizations uh, which, which would like to offset the carbon emission can buy those carbon credits. What do I mean by demonstrate? In order to be able to sell carbon credits, um, projects need to show that mangrove or seagrass areas are being conserved or restored and uh, they also need to measure and monitor the carbon stored in the mangroves or sea grasses. You can see this in action uh, in the photo here uh, which shows a community member from Ambans in uh, northwest Madagascar measuring trees to calculate the carbon uh, stored. Uh, at the moment, uh, two carbon standards are relevant to blue carbon projects, which are uh, the verified carbon standard and plan vivo. And uh, that's the end of my uh, uh, presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, John. That was really great. Um, yeah, that was a really great overview of, um, so, what blue carbon is. Um, we're going to move on to the next uh, the next presentation, and then after that, we're going to have ten or so minutes for questions. So, um, if you have any questions for John that you're worried about forgetting, um, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, and I didn't mention at the beginning of the presentation, for all of the at the beginning of the session, for all of these presentations um, are going to be made available after the sessions, um, as you would have seen from John. Uh, there were a lot of links in there um, and you'll be able to find some additional resources if you want to learn more about the subject of the presentation. Um, so next I am going to explain a little bit about how blue carbon, you know, what does this mean for BV, how does it fit within our strategy. I'm just going to share my screen. Great. Hopefully you can all see that. If someone can give me a thumbs up. Lovely. Thanks, Ruth. You're at the top of my screen. Um, so, so what does this mean for BB? How does this carbon thing fit um, in our strategy uh, and align with our theory of change? Um, so first of all, just to, to take a step back um, uh, and, you know, we are a fisheries organization, um, small scale fishers at the very heart of our strategy. Um, so why on earth are we talking about carbon? Um, as John mentioned, mangroves um, and seagrasses are incredibly important for um, coastal communities um, beyond just carbon uh, in the face of the climate emergency and rising seas um, as a barrier between the open ocean and villages. Um, they form a really important protection against the uh, yeah, rising seas and increasing number of tropical storms. Um, and they are also, um, as many of you will know, uh, a really important habitat for many commercially important fisheries. Um, snapper, mullet, uh, shrimp, sharks and rays, um, you know, they all utilise mangroves at some point during their lives, or maybe all of their lives. Um, so mangroves are really important to them. A study released um, just this year actually from Australia found that one hectare of mangroves supported 19,000 more fish. Um, compared to an unvegetated seabed. Um, so mangroves are really important to fisheries, thus anything that supports or leads to the protection of mangroves um, also leads to hopefully the improvement of fisheries. Uh, I could talk about uh, how awesome mangroves are all day, we sadly don't have time for that. Um, but if you uh, see the link there, you'll see an awesome video that our wonderful Matt 
um, created for uh, Mangrove Day this day. So uh, take a look at that if you're interested in more. Um, so what does this mean for blue carbon? Uh, what did blue carbon mean for BV? Um, so as John said, any management, particularly any local management uh, of these um, blue carbon ecosystems uh, can be seen as blue carbon conservation or restoration. Um, uh, if, um, and that is currently a very big if, particularly for seagrasses, um, from a mangrove side, um, we're going to explain a little bit more what that if means uh, later in the presentation, but if communities can quantify this impact uh, and satisfy the requirements uh, of a carbon standard, like Plan Vivo or, VC or verified carbon standard, as explained by John, um, they can generate carbon credits uh, and thus earn money. So um, I think we should hopefully all be aware of our uh, nice shiny theory of change. Um, uh, organizational theory of change with a vision obviously focused on um, coastal communities. Um, we're managing their um, coasts um, and enriching livelihoods. So what does blue carbon do for this? Um, it affects mainly two parts of this theory of change. Um, the first one is um, a less obvious one um, and it's the strengthening of governance uh, to fulfill carbon credit carbon standard requirements, communities are required to do fairly significant um, monitoring and reporting, um, which if done well and properly and transparently, uh, should support adaptive management and thus strengthen uh, the local governance. But really the main thing that, um, the main part of our theory of change that Blue Carbon contributes towards um, is the addressing barriers bit. So, how does it do this? Um, uh, so two, two main barriers that um, blue carbon can help address. Um, so when I'm saying blue carbon, I mean blue carbon, they're underpinned by um, uh, local management plans. Um, the first is uh, a lack of funding uh, for local management. Uh, I think as most of you know, we've supported the development of um, a blue carbon, a mangrove blue carbon project called Tahiri Hunku in southwest Madagascar. Um, Lilao and Sicilian will talk a lot more about that in uh, later on. Um, but a relevance here is um, the finance sharing arrangement that the communities defined um, as part of the project. So as you will see, uh, management, the management association, uh, which in this case is VA, um, that manages the locally managed marine area that the project sits within, um, gets 23% of the finances. Uh, and this this money can be used not just for mangrove management, but for any of the other broader uh, management activities like fisheries that the uh, association might uh, be supporting or leading. Um, uh, the other barrier being um, a lack of incentive to manage coastal resources. Um, and as you'll see again, the, the, the villages that are partner to the Tahiri Hunku project um, receive uh, 50% um, which can be used, which is up to them what they use it for, um, either improving their livelihoods, improving their well-being, vital infrastructure, it's really up to them what they use that for and that can form an incentive uh, to coastal management. Um, but yeah, the last thing I wanted to say was that, you know, as we saw from the theory of change, um, you know, it, it certainly doesn't address everything. Blue carbon is not a silver bullet. Um, and, you know, the one thing that we've learned is that, you know, it does need to be part of an integrated approach, um, including things like fisheries management or livelihoods diversification um, and where applicable addressing health, um, health needs as well. So that is it from me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, open the floor to any questions that there might be from either John's presentation or my presentation. Don't be shy. <laughs> it's all very clear so far. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, John. Thanks for that feedback. I really appreciate it. Leah, hi, it's Vic. Can I ask a question? Of course you can, Vic. Go ahead. Thanks, yeah. So, you know, it's really clear so far. Thank you so much. And, you know, I'm excited, I'm excited to, to see the data you shared about how many more fish live in mangroves than live in, in, than in unhabitated you know, marine areas. 
it, has it ever been has the has the overall in contribution to marine productivity um, of mangroves been measured? So, so we know that mangroves are an important um, habitat, important for juveniles in particular. Do we know what their overall contribution is to the productivity of a fishery? Um, the, it's a really good question, um, Vic. Uh, there have been many studies looking at this from different angles. Um, so the um, Wetlands International, um, as part of the Mapping Ocean Wealth, uh, they did a really interesting study in looking at the impact of um, uh, mangroves on fisheries enhancement. Um, I'm more than happy to share that paper with you. It doesn't really give any kind of like hard numbers, but it more did like a meta-analysis of all of the data out there. Um, the one thing that they do that every study that, that has looked into this has stressed is how much it varies um, on a site-by-site on a -site basis. Um, there's been a few, there was a really good study in Mexico that looked at the correlation between mangrove area uh, and fisheries product, fisheries catch, I think it was. Um, I don't think it was, it wasn't biomass. I'm hoping that one of our fisheries people can help me out here and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, it was more about productivity. Um, uh, and they found a very clear positive correlation between mangrove fringe area. So not necessarily entire mangrove area, but mangrove fringe area and fisheries productivity. But it is, it's hard, it's challenging because it is so very site specific. Oh, oh, thank, thank you, Hannah. Thanks. <laughs> that, was, that was thanks to Hannah's little prep, prep talk that she gave me the other day. Any other, uh, any other cues that we, uh, oh, one from Nio. So why has BV only focused on mangroves so far and not seagrass? Um, uh, John, would you like to, would you like to, that was very much a little part of your presentation. Is there anything you want to say on that? Or would you prefer yeah, that I answer? Um... Uh, thank you for the question. Um, to be, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to go straight to the point, <laughs> actually. As I said earlier, uh, we have been focused uh, first uh, on mangroves a um, long time ago. May, uh, I don't know when, but uh, in the months since 2012. Uh, we started with uh, mangroves because uh, the science about mangroves were uh, it, pretty clear at the beginning. And, uh, you know, as part of the blue carbon ecosystems, mangrove is the most uh, important one as forests in terms of uh, 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 productivity and uh, uh, blue, uh, blue carbon sequestration and storage. And uh, uh, lately, uh, people or country or the institution working on blue carbon ecosystems started working on uh, sea grasses and salt marshes. And uh, we were thinking to expand uh, our work uh, on sea grasses, uh, as it's part of the system as well, and very important uh, in the system. So, uh, besides, uh, there are a link between mangrove, sea grass, and uh, you know upland forest. So, maybe that's one point we need to focus on it, as we 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 are aiming at uh, restoring. Uh, uh, you know, fisheries as well. As I said, there is a link. So when mangroves are destroyed, seagrass will be destroyed as well. So maybe it's important for us to, to expand our way uh, to, to, to conserve uh, and restore uh, those uh, important ecosystems. I don't know if uh, that's uh, you, address your questions. But uh, as I said, I, we, we were thinking to, to do so on seagrass as well, uh, maybe soon. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, John. 
yeah yeah just to yeah that 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 pretty much summarizes i guess one of the key um the science barriers um to to the seagrass is monitoring change uh, a critical part of developing um and producing carbon credits is being able to show um show either conservation of area or restoration of area and that but that normally requires showing uh, that an ecosystem has remained the same size or has grown. Um, uh, and at the moment, using the current technology, uh, it's quite difficult to um, map changes in seagrass because they're below the ocean. So you can obviously do a certain amount with field surveys, but that's quite expensive and time consuming. Um, and using things like satellite imagery is, is quite difficult. So that's one of the barriers. But we do have a really exciting uh, project with um, uh, um, which Martin and Ryan, I'm not sure if Ryan's on the call, but I know Martin is, um, were a partnership with ICI, the German uh, Climate Fund, uh, who are, and were working as part of that grant um, in Southeast Asia to try and think through some of these challenges um, and how we might be able to realize the uh, potential of seagrass blue carbon um, and, yeah, um, as well as in Madagascar. Right, um, that almost takes us to time. So um, if there aren't any more burning questions, um, I think I'm gonna hand over to the mangrove queen herself, um, Laura Gret, um, who is our, she's a national, new national technical advisor for mangroves in Madagascar and the, uh, the true mangrove queen of BV. Laura, I will hand over to you to give an overview of our journey so far. Uh, thank you, Leah, for giving me the floor. Selamati, jambo, salama, hello for everybody. <laughs> uh, I'm going to share my uh, screen. Uh, I'm done. Uh, Sorry, hold on a bit. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Beautifully. Ah, okay. So uh, I would like to walk you through the uh, Blue Venture Blue Carbon journey uh, about 10 years uh, so far, uh, starting from 2010. Uh, a seeds from in a vast expense of uh, Dr. Garth Scripps, getting him and our uh, writing. Uh, the start of our blue carbon work in Madagascar was in 2011. At that time, at that year, I was uh, joining the mangrove team. Uh, the work started in uh, mapping the mangrove forest in Madagascar and looking for the area where the mangrove laws are. And uh, the field work was uh, conducted in Maitirano. You can see on the map on the left, and you can see where Maitirano is on the uh, blue uh, dots. And um, this mapping led, led us to the large uh, ex extent of mangrove uh, forest in Madagascar, in the northwest of Madagascar, in Ambanza and uh, Mazamba Bay, the largest mangrove forest uh, in the country. Uh, you can see uh, up north on the northwest of Madagascar the two uh, dots, and uh, oh, and um, we continue the uh, carbon um, field work uh, in this uh, area. Uh, as John explained earlier uh, about the uh, carbon storage, uh, once the once the uh, landscape are destroyed. Uh, we can save um, uh, carbon on it. That said, that uh, more carbon credits, and we can get or generate uh, more uh, revenue from the sale of the carbon credit. That is the reason why uh, we uh, we choose Ambanza uh, because it is a potential blue carbon site uh, in Madagascar because the rate of mangrove deforestation in that area is really high due to the uh, practice of uh, charcoal uh, production in uh, this area. Uh, in parallel of this one, uh, we conducted a scoping, uh, scoping uh, to uh, find opportunity 
to uh, implement the carbon project in the southwest of Madagascar, mainly um, in uh, Belgique, in the Fasatan of Belgique, and uh, in Nambundlava, uh, in Chile, uh, which is not a um, uh, Blue Venture site, but uh, in collaboration of uh, an uh, NGO uh, called the Hunku uh, Conservation uh, in the southwest of Chile. Uh, we conducted, uh, we inform and uh, consult the local communities and all of the um, uh, concerned uh, stakeholders to understand their interest um, in implementing the carbon project. And uh, in 2014, the community in Beofasa Sen uh, has decided to want to pursue the mangrove carbon project using the uh, Plan Vivo standard, and they give the name of this project uh, as Tairi Hunku, meaning um, preserving mangrove in local dialect. And this has been done uh, through a democratic, a democratic vote on yes or no to ensure that everyone has a voice uh, to make a decision on the, on the project. At this year also, the first ever the, uh, published mangrove carbon stock of Madagascar, uh, led by Blue Ventures, of course. And um, uh, because of, thanks to the blue carbon work that uh, Blue Venture uh, has been conducted in Madagascar, Madagascar is the one of the few country in the world uh, to uh, integrate the mangrove into the uh, national, uh, national policy of the carbon and also national program of, uh, of carbon. Uh, at the same year, uh, we opened the soil lab uh, in collaboration of the University of Antananarive in Madagascar, which, which is enabling us to uh, conduct the soil analysis in the country, but not always relying uh, to do the uh, analysis within uh, other country. Um, the project idea note, uh, which is the first documentation of the Tairuhu project, has been uh, approved by Plan Vivo in 2015. And um, at this year also, uh, we decided uh, to pose uh, the carbon project uh, in Nambanza because of the technical uh, challenges. The VCS, the verified carbon standard, is very complex. And uh, this requires um, extensive uh, science. And uh, also, uh, the, the, the study on dynamism of the soil uh, carbon loss in the mangrove is uh, too complex. And um, there is also uh, implementation challenges, including uh, the size of the area, very large. And um, uh, in the area also, uh, we haven't found any viable alternative for the mangrove charcoal, and that is the reason why we put uh, the uh, carbon project, um, uh, blue carbon project in Ambanza on pause in 2015. Um, in 2016, 16, we focus on extensive uh, community consultation, including, including the village meeting and the village workshop to define the mangrove management zoning and the regulation for the Tairihunku project and uh, continuing the um, science, uh, science activity in, uh, in Nambanza. Okay. And um, in 2015-17, uh, we still uh, co a continuation of uh, community, community consultation and uh, following the four, more than 40 village consultation, the benefit sharing ar arrangement was finalized by uh, local communities uh, within the area. As uh, Leah said earlier, uh, community decides on the use of the revenue uh, generated by the sale of the carbon credit and the mangrove management plan of the uh, of, um, mangrove at Beofasa Sen was also finalized uh, by uh, local communities and the Belgic Association, which underpin the uh, Tairihunku project. And um, lastly, on this, uh, on this year, 
you can see on the you, you can see the map on top of the map of Madagascar uh, during the, the, this time uh, we conducted the scoping um, scoping uh, for the new site of blue carbon in Indonesia um, Madagascar has sorted out um, a strategy for the uh, national forest carbon in 2018 and uh, which helped us uh, to move on the on the Tairihuku project and the Tairihuku final document has also been submitted to the plan vivo we had uh, successfully uh, host the external validator uh, to visit the ground and um, audit the Tairihuku project which is um, one of the steps uh, to register the, the Tairihuku and um, in Indonesia uh, we managed we managed to select the first site um, of a blue carbon site in Indonesia you can see on the map um, the, the blue dot in uh, Sambilan National Park uh, uh, which is um, uh, south of um, Somantran and 2019, the Tairi Huku project has been validated and uh, approved by uh, Plan Vivo and uh, officially uh, launched, uh, follow after the five, five years um, uh, following the introduction of this project to the communities. And um, we also, at this year also, we uh, selected the second site of a blue carbon uh, site in Indonesia, uh, which is focused on mangrove uh, conservation and protection, of course. Um, in Kubu, Raya, sorry if I, miss, uh, if I spell it uh, wrong, <laughs> Kubu, Raya. And uh, this site is a um, uh, potential candidate uh, for, for the plan uh, project, uh, similar to Tahiri Hoko. And uh, this year, 10 years later, uh, the good news are the uh, first annual report for the Tairuhunk has been approved by uh, Plan Vivo. That means that uh, we can sell the carbon uh, generated by the Tairuhunk project. And um, currently, over um, 4,500 um, carbon credits for Tairuhunk has been pre sold uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the buyer. Lots of buyer, uh, lots of uh, to, not to buyer to the uh, yeah buyers, not founder but uh, buyer buyers. Um, but uh, there are some um, uh, bad news uh, uh, on the Tairuhuku. Uh, there is a policy barrier uh, which hold us uh, to move and to proceed to uh, proceed on the on the sale of the carbon credit generated and validated uh, by plan before for the, for the uh, for 2018 and uh, we also realize that uh, there is low motivation of the community in Belgique because the uh, the duration and lengthy uh, project development project because we introduced this project from 2014 and um, we are currently on 2020 uh, and community haven't received uh, income from this and uh, this um, dropped on the motivation of the community and uh, one uh, good news is uh, we successfully published the uh, research conducted uh, in Nambanda uh, related to the quantification of this uh, loss of uh, soil carbon uh, post mangrove deforestation. Uh, I think that's all from me, and um, I will um, uh, give back the speech to Lia. Awesome, thanks so much, Alain. Uh That was really great. Um, we've had some cool, quite good questions as well um, coming in from the chat that we'll hold until the Q&A at the end of the session. But if you want to take a look at them, Lalao, and think about responses, um, go ahead. Um, for the sake of time, um, uh, will the floor will be open to um, our friend Cicelin, who um, coordinates uh, our blue our mangrove and blue carbon technical work in the southwest of Madagascar. 
Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much for giving me the floor, uh, Dia. So let me just uh, share the screen. Do you see my screen? Hello? Yes, yes. we see. We see. Okay. Uh, my you my can face, my face. Uh, present, uh, present mode. Yeah. Sorry, it takes a bit long. Ooh. Sorry, I have a bit technical. But, uh, yeah, um, so now I'm going to to give you an overview of uh, uh, the opportunities, the lesson learned, and uh, the challenges that we are facing uh, through the long journey of the uh, implementation of the carbon uh, project in Madagascar. Uh, so it takes a bit long. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to start with the, the positive points. In fact, so um, the first thing is that the potential uh, for carbon, uh, the income from carbon credit can act as incentive for the marine management, and also increase uh, community uh, commitment. Because why? Because uh, the community consider uh, the conservation based on payment. Uh, as better than the other type of mangrove, uh, and uh, second, um, community participation uh, at the whole stage of a project uh, also um, is important. Because why? Because it promotes uh, ownership of the project and also promote collective buy-in uh, for the project, uh, which increase, um, in fact. Uh, the change of successfully uh, implement a, a project. And uh, apart from that, uh, reforestation activities uh, are part of the big uh, activity within the project, uh, which give a great opportunity uh, to the women and youth uh, uh, to participate because uh, most of the time they are less active uh, in the management process. And uh, the, one of the uh, positive points also is that uh, carbon finance is not only uh, for managing mangrove, but also potential to fund uh, a broader activities, such as fisheries management. Uh, and another interesting thing is uh, the high interest in buying blue carbon uh, credits uh, in the international market. Uh, for example, as Lelo uh, said uh, during the previous presentation, uh, the case of Tayil Hoku project that I'm managing in the southwest of Madagascar, um, it was very easy for us to sell the carbon credits, and now we have already uh, secured uh, buyers of carbon credits up to 2021. And lastly, uh, implementation of our blue, uh, blue carbon project uh, in Madagascar also uh, influenced uh, policy advocacy. Uh, why? Because uh, the blue carbon uh, uh, mechanism highlighted the importance of mangrove and also their benefits, the benefits of their conservation uh, all across uh, Madagascar. So, if those are the, the, the positive points, so we will so uh, faced with uh, lots of challenges. So the first of this is the national political influences. Uh, so for example, the eventual change in the government members influence the institutional uh, institution in charge of the mangroves and also in charge of the carbon project. So as a result, uh, multiple there is a multiple and uh, changing institution deals with the, the, the carbon project in Madagascar. And the second is 
Um, the law and policy regarding the mangrove and the carbon rights, as the law stated. For example, Madagascar, there is no clear law regarding carbon, carbon rights in here. And also in 2014, uh, uh, the national government uh, sorted out a degree that banned the mangrove user rights, uh, which is really complicated to manage the mangrove. And uh, in the future, even uh, for example, the, the government is uh, amending the law regarding the mangroves, and the community will have a uh, right to use mangroves. It doesn't mean that uh, within the era of mangrove, the community uh, will not have a carbon right. Uh, so, um, because we were struggling with uh, these uh, problems. So it led the, it led the community uh, the impressions. Why? Because uh, it takes uh, so, so long, uh, the introduction of project to the first income. So it was lowering their motivation, as Lalao said recently. And apart from that also, uh, the weekend requirements for the monitoring of carbon stocks uh, can be complicated for the local community and even for the Blue Ventures members, as the law said recently, because it's, it's really complicated uh, scientifically, uh, especially when we uh, talk about uh, verified carbon standards. And uh, one of the big challenges that we are facing also is um, the law capacity to enforce law, both at the local and national level. So it's, it is caused by a lot of factors. For example, at the national level, uh, the, um, the government often limit the fund funding allocated to monitoring and enforcement. And at the local level, uh, there is no support from the government and people are fear of their security because uh, it is like a common resources and it's, it's dangerous for the local people to, to go along without support of the government. So, so what are then the, uh, the solution or the strategies that uh, we will use then to address all of these problems? So um, even though uh, Blue Ventures uh, was there uh, from the beginning to support uh, the technical uh, aspects, for the design and implementation of the project. Um, so our objective was to give power to local, local association to lead the project. Why? Because if they lead the project, uh, they can feel that uh, they are owner of the project and also they understand the whole processes and uh, they can solve uh, you know, those problems within the society that they are living. And uh, apart from that also, just to uh, avoid a misunderstanding of the context of the project, uh, we also uh, conducted a frequent uh, listening and visits uh, within at the village level, talking with the local communities. But uh, uh, the lesson that should be uh, uh, sorted out from this is that we should do like a careful planning if we do like workshop or community meeting because uh, sometimes uh, it causes uh, meeting fatigue. So you should make sure that it is avoided. And uh, the one um, particular point that important also is that uh, communication uh, tools also need to be well developed and need to be adapted to the local context so that community can understand what and uh, what are the objectives of the project and what are the incomes, the, the outcomes, sorry. And uh, last one, uh, Blue Ventures also should, uh, should not be uh, led, should be led by the community needs and interests rather than ecological conditions because for the case of uh, the Northwest of Madagascar, the case of Mbanza, uh, when Blue Ventures um, perceived that there was a, a high rate of deforestation in the area, 
and they proposed a uh, mango carbon project on their verified uh, carbon standard as a solution to address this problem. But uh, in, uh, actually, it is not related to the needs of the communities. But uh, on the contrary, in the uh, southwest of Madagascar, as the law uh, showed uh, during her presentation, um, the planting of project was, uh, let's say, adequate for the area because the local community, uh, since, since the starting, um, showed uh, their initiative and vote democratically uh, the, the implementation of um, plant depot project. And uh, the last one, uh, another um, lesson learned also is that as the project, uh, like the Taipu project, is implemented at the local level, uh, where uh, the knowledge of community uh, uh, is limited and lots of people have a lower level of education. So, uh, capacity building is needed, uh, uh, especially uh, in terms of uh, governance uh, of resource and in terms of leadership to be prepared in the management of the project. And uh, also, as I stated uh, in the previous presentation, um, we thought that a lot community to, um, to monitor carbon stock should be uh, simplified so that they can take part in the, the carbon measurement. And one of the important things also is that uh, we, sh um, we should develop as uh, in the uh, Taipu project area. So we developed a standard operational procedures uh, for each activity within the project. Why? Because it's important to facilitate the handover because uh, as we said that uh, it should be handed to the local association so the, uh, the standard uh, operational procedure documents are important to, to facilitate this handover. And also it's, uh, the, those documents also are very uh, uh, useful to adaptively manage uh, the project. And um, apart from that, uh, uh, to implement, to succeed, to succeed in the uh, implementation of projects, we need also a multidisciplinary team. Uh, for example, we need like a social scientist, a local scientist, and also people who has like a strong relationship with the local community to facilitate uh, the relationship with them. And uh, finally, uh, the support of the government is uh, really, really crucial. Uh, it's at the whole uh, scales. Uh, uh, when I, for example, stating at the international level, uh, the support of the government uh, is uh, very important uh, to support the validation and the registration of the project. Uh, for example, at the plan before foundations. Uh, at the national level, the support of the government also is important to influence the policy. And at local level, actually, it's important uh, to support the community controlling, uh, the monitoring, and also the enforcement of the law. Because without the government support, people are uh, afraid of uh, enforcing the law. I think that's all for my uh, participation, and thank you for your uh, listening. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Cicelyn. Some really interesting lessons learned and a lot of food for thought as we uh, kind of sit back and think about um, oh myself again um, uh, <laughs> think about uh, you know what we've learned and where we're going with blue carbon and and what makes the most sense for the people that we serve as in coastal communities thank you so much we're running a little bit um a little bit behind schedule but we definitely had some questions on that one um, uh, uh, Camis, do you want to um, ask your question um, about um, uh, voice of power? I'm not sure if you're still there. There. Well, Rupert, I think you had a similar a similar question. Hello, everybody. Oh, excellent. Hi. Um, my question is um, when he she's uh, explaining on the process of involving community and applying the um, yes and no voting system. 
where sometimes it it's happened where the 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 vo- powerless are represented by by the the figure with power. How do they uh, make sure that it is not happening? So everybody is inclusive. His idea. Thank you. Uh, Dia, would you like would you like me to answer that? Or? Sorry, yes, I got distracted. Yes, please. Allow. Okay. Please, uh, uh, thank please you, Camille, answer. for your question. A very relevant question. Um, as I explained, uh, we do the vote uh, in a democratic way. So, uh, to ensure that everyone has a voice, uh, we prepare uh, because uh, oh. the community in the villages, in the concerned villages. Uh, do not have the uh, same level of, um, of education. Some community members uh, do not know how to write. And uh, the way we did it is um, uh, we have uh, two different colors of paper. And uh, people uh, who would like to say yes, use the uh, red color, uh, green color, and the no is uh, red color and that is the system that we use and uh, also for every type of um, of activities we do it in a participatory manner to ensure that everyone every group of a community has a voice uh, to make a decision on the project activity so no one is um, excluded uh, on the decision making uh, I don't know. It's just... Thank you. Can I, can, I, um, can I add something? Yes, go ahead, Cecilia. Yeah, you just uh, about the, the community voting, because uh, in the case of uh, a project area, we work with 10 villages, and uh, when we did the voting, nine villages voted uh, accept implementation of a plan for project, and the one village didn't accept, but we didn't uh, stay with this, uh, these people not accepting, but we've been trying to, to, uh, to know why, why, why they were not uh, agree, why, why they didn't agree with, with the voting, the implementation of project. And they say it was new, it was new, not really clear for them, so they need more clarification. So what we did is then to uh, to uh, to do frequent visit and awareness raising about uh, the project because it's it's essential for the startup of the project, like inform people about the context of the project and when they know that um, this project uh, is like a beneficial for them, then they get back uh, for voting yes at that time. Hey, thanks so much, Cicelem, for that added, uh, added context. Can I um, really encourage, so this, one of the reasons for this webinar is, is to, to start some of these discussions and connect, um, connect field with the central team and, and uh, Madagascar with uh, uh, our amazing team, the WIO. So please, um, I know we're limited on time here, but please feel free to connect outside on Workplace, on Hangouts, on anything, um, if that didn't, um, if that didn't uh, fully, if you, if you want to know anything more about that. Um, Rini, you had a question. Um, I, we're gonna have to keep it quite brief, um, uh, but, uh, and again, you can, you can um, connect with Lau and Cicelyn, um outside, but um, uh, do, you wanna, do you wanna say your question, Rini? I, I, I read it already. Right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I think like uh, you can you can read it or I can read it. Uh, you know, like uh, the preparation mm-hmm. of uh, Tahiri Honko project, like uh, the meetings, lots of meetings, empowering. Uh, I heard about uh, low capacity and uh, like uh, the community needs to be empowered, and a lot of like uh, verification process, external validations as well, and like at uh, the time, I think like uh, from the preparation until that the carbon ready to be sold. It, it took like almost five years. 
So if we counted in like all of those investment, I mean, like currently we are paying it through the, the project money, but if it is like a, as a own investment, uh, as the capital uh, investment and uh, like uh, income generated from the uh, from selling the carbon, overall, do you think that it is still profitable? This um, blue carbon. Thank you. Lao Sicilian, do you want me to answer this one? Oh, we'll take your yeah. muted silence. <laughs> it's it's a really great yeah. question. Thanks, Cicelyn. Um, Yeah, it's it's a really great question. Uh, it's very easy to answer. Um, so, uh, Tahiri Honku is um, unique in an unfortunate way in the fact that it's in a very arid environment, um, uh, meaning that the mangrove carb the mangrove isn't hugely productive from a carbon perspective, um, meaning the amount of carbon saved by community conservation um, is lower, a lot lower, a huge amount lower than it would be in somewhere like Indonesia. Um, what that means is that, all, that also means that there are less carbon credits available for sale and thus, thus less income. Um, in the case of Tahiri Hunku, um, yeah, the, the, the carbon credit sales um, definitely do not cover um, the implementation costs. But I think like the interesting point here is like um, the there's the there's the costs associated with management, um, uh, and then there's the additional there's the costs that are only associated because we did a carbon project, um, and they're kind of two things. Because from a blue ventures perspective, there's the argument that that we would have been doing that work anyway, um, uh, and thus you know the the carbon income shouldn't be expected to cover our costs. Um, it certainly didn't cover the, it didn't, it also didn't cover the community's costs associated with setting up the project. But from a BB side, um, there's an argument to say that we, you know, we as a not-for-profit marine conservation organization would have been doing that anyway. Um, but yeah, but the, the, um, but the summary is, is that yes, um, the carbon credit income for Tihiri Unku does not cover the implementation costs, but that doesn't mean that that's not, that that's the case for all sites. Um, areas like Ambanza, where there's potential for more carbon credits in Indonesia, where there's a lot higher amount of carbon stored, um, uh, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. I hope that answers your question. Rini. Thanks, Rini. Right. Um, uh, I am, um, any more questions related to that, please feel free to put them in the Q&A um, and Lilau and Cicelyn um, can connect with you um, after, the, um, after the session um, to answer any more questions that you might have. Um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna move us on to the last bit, which is kind of um, uh, a little bit about the, the future. But to start, uh, I am going to talk about um, uh, where does BV fit in with the kind of like the global landscape of blue carbon um, and who else is doing what? I'm going to keep this very brief for the sake of time. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, again, the presentations are going to be made um, available to you guys and everybody else. So feel free to um, read them in more detail when um, after the fact. So hopefully you should be able to see my screen. Um, so yeah, I guess I this one is mainly, <laughs> what a beautiful photo. Um, the, uh, th this one is mainly for our fundraising team. I saw Maya on here earlier. Um, uh, so uh, hopefully, she, hopefully she's still there. Um, but uh, really talking about where BV sits. So this is going against a little bit our humble value. Um, but uh, really you know thanks to the generosity and patience um, of the communities um, we serve we've been on such a long journey with the Belunjek Association in the development of Tahiri Hunku um, uh, and we've learned as you learned from Sicily um, we've learned a huge amount the Belunjek Association has learned a huge amount as well um, and through that process um, you know we, we are now seen um, as leaders in um, blue carbon and implementation supporting blue carbon implementation um, and that is, um, again, 
thanks in a large part to the yeah 10 years of work by Lalau and Cicilline and the rest of the and Jean and the rest of the team in Madagascar who have really kind of like stuck with this through the through the highs and the lows. Um, very quickly um, we obviously don't work in a vacuum um, some of the people that we work with from a blue carbon perspective um, communities are obviously already um, always our, um, our primary focus um, but as we look to um, share some of the lessons we've learned and, look and learn from other organizations in the outreach-esque approach. Um, we're also starting to work with some um, other values aligned NGOs and um, particularly in Indonesia. Um, we have some really strong and generous academic partners that have supported a lot of the work that John has done from a science side, um, particularly University of Antananarivo in Madagascar um, and an Australian and a UK university. Um, and we're also a member of various different um, global networks and partnerships. I'm not going to go into detail in these because it's not a good use of our time, but the links and information are all there. Um, who else is doing what? Um, I think it's an interesting one to kind of like ground us in what else is going on in the world. Uh, there is only one other blue carbon conservation, so either mangrove, or mangroves or seagrass conservation project in the world. Um, aside from Tahiri Hunku, that's a project called um, Makoko Fomoja in Kenya, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, but there are a lot of um, blue carbon restorations in mangrove or seagrass, well, mangrove restoration projects. Um, I've given a link to one in Myanmar. Um, as far as other NGOs, particularly INGOs, um, Conservation International are very much, um, they're also leaders in the space. They lead the Blue Carbon Initiative and are also developing a VCS project in Colombia with the government there. Um, Nature Conservancy are um, their thought leaders, particularly in the policy space. I'm thinking about how blue carbon fits in with countries' commitments through the Paris Agreement. Um, there are a lot of smaller NGOs also really interested in blue carbon. Not many are able to do much because of the barriers that we're going to go through in the next presentation. Um, and increasingly, as you know, as the uh, interest in this blue carbon in these blue carbon credits um, emerges, uh, there is increasing interest, um, perhaps slash likely concernedly, from um, for-profit commercial entities um, that are also interested in uh, in investing in blue carbon. Um, so that was a very, very quick overview of, of where we sit. Um, uh, I don't think, let me see if I can just go straight. So hopefully you can all see that. But, um, but to, to finish us off for the last uh, five or so minutes of the presentation, um, I did just want to kind of like discuss with you and be open about some of the ideas um, we're thinking about as far as blue carbon going forward um, and particularly get your feedback, your, your, your ideas, your thoughts um, based on what you've heard today. Um, we're obviously not going to have a huge amount of time to do that in this webinar, but this is you know, going to be the start of a conversation about this going forward because particularly for myself and uh, the, the rest of the mangrove and blue carbon team, this is you know, something we're, we're thinking about now and going to be thinking about increasingly in the future. We are seen as sector leaders um, from a blue carbon perspective. Um, and you know, where, where are we going with this? Um, uh, so just kind of to, to reiterate this fact, um, uh, you know, there is, there is increasing, um, still not enough, but increasing interest in nature-based solutions to the climate emergency. Um, uh, uh, and with this interest comes finance. Um, uh, still not enough, but this is, you know, this, we're seeing a huge increase in this recently. Um, in highly, I think we all know that in highly dependent sessions, you know, where people really depend on the ocean for their lives, um, uh, uh, marine management costs them money um, uh, and uh, livelihood diversification and alternative livelihoods are obviously a really important tool um, to try and address this um, but in the absence of equally lucrative um, alternative livelihoods you know there is the potential for this carbon finance to help fill that gap a little bit um, you know it is this is an unrealized commodity for coastal communities um, why not unlock it to help cover um, some of these opportunity costs. 
Um, but as you would have seen um, from Cicillin, particularly Cicillin's presentations, you know, there, there are some barriers. Blue carbon has been a buzzword for over 10 years now. Why are our, why are our tropical coasts not littered with blue carbon projects? And why does BV only support one project after uh, 10 years of um, big investment and hard work? Um, so there are still barriers, um, some, a lot of which um, Cicillin um, touched on in his um, challenges section. Um, firstly, financial and geographic inequality. Um, so using the, the carbon standards currently available for blue carbon, uh, creating a project costs a lot of money. Um, and most of these costs are associated with the certification and auditing process. Uh, meaning that this is very much relevant to what um, Rini was saying. You know, I mean, if a project is to be financially self-sustaining, um, less money is available for marine management because it's having to cover these costs um, and also the well-being of coastal people. Um, and one thing to note is this auditing and certification money generally ends up in the north, does not stay in the global south, does not stay with the communities. Um, uh, as Cicillin so eloquently explained, you know, the, the policies governing blue carbon are complex, um, often overseen by many different government bodies and a lot of bureaucracy, um, which, can, which can make blue carbon as it currently stands, uh, both time consuming and also risky. Um, the speed is interesting because, you know, I think we as an organization know that effective marine management really does take, you know, proper time to nurture, um, you know, time and patience on the community side um, and time and patience for supporting organization side like ourselves. Um, a lot of the time it's taken to develop the Tahiri Hunku project was, um, you know, was through the communities discussing, creating and agreeing the, the management plans that underpin the project. Um, but under the current blue carbon framework, communities can't earn carbon finance until this marine management is up and running um, and effective. You, you know, it has to be effective for these carbon credits to be released. Um, so whilst this is, you know, this is an incentive, this is the incentive that we've been talking about, um, it, you know, it blocks blue carbon finance from supporting, you know, the development of this management and this governance. Uh, lastly, again, as was touched on by both Lalao and Cicillin, um, the carbon standards, that, that, uh, the, the current carbon standards and particularly the carbon science required by them are incredibly complex um, and really force dependency on English speaking organizations like Blue Ventures. Um, this also adds to the geographic inequality that I mentioned at the start. Um, so these are some of the barriers, but as a little bit of an uplifter, you know, there, there is stuff that we can do. And this is what we're thinking about. Um, you know, we really are looking to disrupt the, sec the sector um, and create a, a, you know, a new framework for blue carbon that actually works for coastal communities. Um, Certainly, and it's this work and thinking is very much in its infancy, as I said. Um, so, you know, open to all ideas, looking for additional thoughts and, uh, and pieces. Um, but the future is definitely exciting. So as some of the ideas we've currently got running around um, from a financial and geographic inequality perspective, you know, can, I think this is going to be a central piece of BB's strategy that Al's going to release over the coming days is, you know, connecting communities directly to carbon finance. Um, skipping out all of the middlemen which are currently taking taking significant portions of the finance peer-to-peer -peer uh, monitoring and evaluation uh really so kind of dem democratize the, the 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 whole process really and also that will significantly decrease the costs um from a policy angle you know a lot of the policy challenges come because we're talking about carbon you know are there other ways we can label this um this this outcome or this impact uh, speed of tangible returns, um, clearer, simpler frameworks that are really readily accessible to communities and grassroots organisations, um, and also with a potential for startup funding. So you're not reliant on the generation of um, credits post conservation. Um, and lastly, really being the you know the complexity of the carbon science. So leveraging our networks and our experience to to develop tools. Um, that can be used by, you know, CBOs and CSOs around the world to, to help them access this climate finance. Uh, one of the tools we're working on at the moment is a mangrove mapping uh, and change analysis tool, which we hope will be uh, finalised later this year. 
Um, and really lastly, so what are we doing to, you know, to try and get some of these ideas um, going? Um, we, while we are building on our networks and reputation, um, we are very much continuing being led um, by our learning and needs on the ground. Um, we've got a really exciting partnership with, a, with an investment services firm called Pollen Street Capital, who are helping us think through, you know, what is the business case for this new framework? Um, is it investable? Is it interesting? Are there investors out there that might be interested? Um, we're recruiting for a new team member, a new technical advisor to support the Lao, John, the rest of us um, in the thinking um, and the, um, the development of this business plan uh, and, yeah, and ongoing discussions with, uh, uh, yeah, market, other market leaders, the carbon standards, the BCS in particular, um, and also critically potential investors. So that was quite a uh, epic uh, run through. And thank you very much for your patience in listening to it. Um, I haven't had a chance to read through the questions. Woo! Quite a few. This is definitely adaptive management at its best. Um, I am definitely. I've been keeping an eye on them, Leah, so I can pass them on to you if you want. Thanks. Yeah, I, know, I just want to stress that, you know, we will, um, there are probably questions in there that I won't be able to answer, that allow will be able to, and allow the team will be able to answer. We will answer all questions in the post-meeting uh, post pack. Have you seen any particular, Jenny, that you think is, uh, that you think are of interest? Yeah, your, your voice has just become a bit robotized, Leah. I don't know if that's just for me, but I can still... Oh, we cannot hear you properly. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll pass you on a question and then maybe we can try again to see if it's gone back to normal for you. Um, but yeah, so one um, which I think is from Rupert is what in, you mentioned quite a few different NGOs um, and he was interested to know what our relationships are like with these other bingos who are in the blue carbon space. So the robot. Yes. yes. I'm going to need to join my tablet. I'm going to have to do some Sorry. I don't know if, if um, Lilau or any of the others from the Blue Forest team want to answer that question. Perhaps I might pass this one on to. Um, Probably this is a question for Sisana. So what's the difference between the Plan Vivo and the new VCS standards? Um, as, far as, I, as far as I know, that maybe Lelo can help me. So in fact, uh, the fight carbon standard is, is not new, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a standard. All of them are standards. Plan Vivo is a standard and the fight carbon also is a standard. But the different the difference is Plan Vivo is a small scale um, carbon pro project that is focused on payment for ecosystem services. But um, verified carbon standard is a large scale um, um, of car or carbon project, no, 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 not only mangrove, but large scale carbon project. But uh, I don't know if the law can add, help me in clarifying this. Uh, okay, as Cicelain said, uh, but Leah can, uh, can add uh, if, um, if she would like to add something. Uh, both of uh, Plan Vivo and, um, and VCS are uh, international carbon standards and uh, they are uh, recognized uh, at international level. But uh, the difference from the two standards are the Plan Vivo uh, standard is uh, intended uh, to be run by a uh, community. So, uh, the requirement is um, um, softer compared to the requirement of uh, VCS uh, in terms of the uh, methodology uh, for, for the carbon stock measurement, uh, for instance. The uh, VCS requires very rigorous uh, scientific measurement to assess the carbon stock compared to the plan vivo. And uh, that, is the, that is the main difference uh, on the two standards, but, but both of the standards are 
internationally recognized. Great. I Thank don't you. know if Leah would like Absolutely nothing to add. Thank you, Lilau. And thanks everyone for your patience while I uh, got rid of my robot voice. Um, if I stop it on my computer, I'm worried it's going to stop it for everyone. So, uh, yeah, no, nothing to add on that. Okay. Shall I add, um, pass another question to you, Leah? Um, I think I might go with, um, just quickly with both of um, Rupert's, who I'm guessing is BB Farnham. Um, uh, as far as, if, if you've done the policy and legal barriers. No, that's the um, one I was just going to ask you about. So that would be great if you could cover that one. I'll quickly do the the bingos um relation currently um rupert is good um we are seen as not too threatening and occupying our own space however that may change once we look to go for the blue carbon 2.0 and, and and disrupt things a little bit more but um currently it is we are we are friends with most people and seen as unthreatening um, regarding the policy challenges, just really quickly at the global level, I think Lalau and um, Sicilian talk quite a lot at the um, about at the Madagascar level, but globally, how offsets how offset projects sit within the NDC framework. So um, uh, mo every country that is a signatory to the Paris Agreement has made a um, a, co a commitment to how much they're going to decrease their emissions between now and 2030 and now in 2050. Um, the controversy is, and this isn't just related to carbon, um, but carbon offsets more, more, more broadly as well, is if a organization or a community, say a community in, um, in Kubraya in Indonesia, uh, sells, sells their offset to a automotive company in Germany, then that is, addressing the off the, the emissions of Germany and not Indonesia. Um, so you know countries currently have a lot of, you know, particularly um, less developed countries are getting a lot of money to support this in NDC process and their commitments. Um, and that is causing globally some hesitation in countries um, to approve these offset projects where the offsets are going to be sent to other countries. So that's that's kind of like more of a global picture. So in, in relation to that, Leah, there was a question from Will, which was around, should we be setting up a global blue carbon policy unit to support and advise governments on unblocking these kinds of legal and regulatory issues? I'm interested in Lilau, Sicily and John's opinion on this. Lilau, do you have any, any thoughts on this idea? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch it. I'm sorry. Um, so what was the question? So we'll, so we'll ask the question, should we be setting up a global blue carbon policy unit to support and advise governments on unblocking legal and regulatory issues to help them and their communities assess these new blue carbon capital flows? Um, uh, I think uh, Madagascar has joined the International Partnership for the Blue Carbon. Uh, but uh, we didn't do a uh, thing on it because uh, this is only uh, a platform uh, for exchange of a pra practice and uh, not platform for, uh, for founding. And we are not really interested to learn uh, from, from this platform. And um, at the global level, mm, Maybe global level doesn't really work for Madagascar, but maybe for the Indian Ocean, at least. That is uh, my opinion, but uh, I don't know what this line uh, think about it. Yes, um, it should be going like this because uh, at the global level, it is as as uh, global. It's it's really difficult then to um, to convince uh, Malagasy uh, government. So if we talk about uh, uh, Indian Ocean, because we already have uh, Iora Indian Ocean Association, Indian Ocean Dream Association, which is um, 
uh, a kind of uh, network that uh, are working on Buka bundle and they are focused on uh, uh, promoting uh, Buka bundle in the Indian Ocean. So working with this network will be uh, will be an opportunity to uh, to launch this uh, uh, let policy advocacy. That's a great idea, Sullivan. Um, well, I'll um, I'll certainly give you my opinion next time we catch up. Uh, and in relation to that, um, yeah, we'll certainly go through the questions that remain on the Q and A and make sure to to answer them all um, after the meeting. Uh, thank you for um, yeah, just a general really um, as we approach time for um, yeah for listening, inputting. Um, uh, yeah, this has definitely been a learning exercise. Um, I really want to thank John, Lalau and Cicelin who put a huge amount of work in, particularly this week, um, to preparing their presentations um, and ensuring that they nailed it. So thank you guys. Um, just lastly, again, just a, um, a reminder to if you've got any more questions or want to learn more or want to be more involved in certain parts, please do feel free to um, reach out to any of us on email or workplace. And lastly, I just want to take the last two minutes to say thank you to Steve, um, our rock star uh, website coding genius, um, who has, um, uh, we now have a shiny new mangroves and blue carbon section on the staff internet. It is very much a work in progress, I'm not going to lie. Um, uh, and yeah, myself and the rest of the team will be adding to this um, over, the, over the coming weeks. Um, um, to make sure it's it's fully equipped, but uh, yeah, these presentations will be made available um, on there and will be shared with you. And also the um, the recording for this webinar, and you'll also find some other interesting blue carbon bits and pieces um, in the blue carbon section. So I think that pretty much uh, takes us to time. Um, Jenny, I'm sorry that we didn't get a chance to do the uh, the, uh, the 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 poll thing, but um, but uh, yeah. we'll make sure. To you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll follow up with all of you for some feedback uh, um, after the call. But yeah, thanks so much again to everyone who uh, attended, and uh, yeah, look forward to touching base with you all soon. Thank well you. done, guys. Great session. Really good. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks all. Thank you very much. Really great. Good work, guys. Bye bye. Thank you. See you everyone. Bye, Lala. Bye, John. Well done. Bye. 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 Oh, and thank you. Uh, we have our East Africa friends. They're only just leaving us. Thank you for joining. Come here, Sanasila, if you're still there. It's really great to have you part of this. Thank you very much. Oh. Jenny. Thank you. Um, am I still? I'm gonna. I'm not even gonna unmute. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we never got to do the uh, the the bits and pieces. But yeah. Um, no worries. That Cicely was great, Leah. And, um, I'm going to, uh, uh, one second. <laughs>